at the oral exam and I had to fail 16. Uh, and three received satisfactory, which is the lowest, most mark to still pass. So <laughs> my mean mark is 1.1, but I win. Okay. We hope we will have less online uh, education this year, so yeah. it should improve. Okay, so it is 10 o'clock. And it is my pleasure to welcome everyone to the second day of the eighth conference on scholarly communication in the context of open science, PubMed 2021. So yesterday we had a full day with four inspiring sessions, some of which attracted more than 200 attendees. We hope today's program will be equally interesting. So we start with a very hot topic, trust in science. Our first speaker is Vedran Katavic. He is a professor of human anatomy at the University of Zagreb School of Medicine. He has extensive experience in teaching from the graduate courses of anatomy to the continuing education of MDs in writing and publishing science scientific papers. Also, he teaches postgraduate courses on responsible conduct of research. He has been a member or a president of a number of national and international committees for ethics and science and higher education, research ethics and integrity. Uh, many of you had the opportunity to hear from him during our previous conferences. If I went in detail through all of his posts and achievements, it would take too much of our valuable time. And I'm sure you'd rather listen to what he has to say on today's topic. So Vedran, the stream is yours. Uh, excellent, thank you. Uh, thank you for this wonderful introduction. It's, uh, it's more than I could have hoped. Um, can everyone see my screen with the snake Ka telling you trust in me or trust in science? Um, when, I was, when I was first asked to uh, participate, here, that was, that was some six months ago, we had a different discussion and I thought, oh, this will be fun. But I had no idea what, <laughs> what Leo was going to ask me to do. Um, so I, I received, I would say, the hottest potato <laughs> in, in this pan, um, how to restore or how to strengthen trust in science. And when I first, um, thought about this and what I wanted to say, I thought that I would mostly discuss how the COVID pandemic has shown us how, how our society is basically divided into at least two groups of people, uh, one who do trust in science and one who pick and choose what trust in science. Because I think that even the most avid anti-vaxxers still drive cars um, occasionally uh, travel by plane, um, use trams and, and other technologies. So they pick and choose which portions of, of science they want to trust and which parts they don't trust. So in this sort of a, a logical dissociation or, or, or problems that we see, uh, I thought that that would be more interesting but with the latest things that have been happening with the increased violence, um, I sort of went away from discussing anti, anti-vaxxers and, and COVID. I think that we're fed up with COVID. And I, I made an abstract that, that's, that's aim was to recall that we do teach kids science from grammar school on or for ground school on. And um, most of them trust in science, but as time goes on, they sort of lose, lose that trust or some lose that trust or it's difficult to maintain that trust for some. So let me then try and tell you how I feel or how I see this topic of trust in science. And I think it has to do a lot with how and why. Um, the whys here are 
why science is even performed or why science is even published. And then there is a whole host of, whole host of, uh, of hows. So if we start with, with why uh, science is published and why science is performed, I always say that we as scientists have this privilege of being able to let our imaginations wander, um, concentrate our uh, thoughts on interesting ideas, uh, try to dissect the truth as we see it um, and the world as we see it and, and try to find reason behind it. Uh, but that is an idealized way of looking at science. And if you observe just some of these um, uh, funny uh, cartoons, why people do science, um, my colleague is wrong and I can finally prove it. That's an incredible, an incredibly valid uh, form of scientific publication. Or we put a camera in a new place. Uh, <laughs> we are 500 scientists and here's what we've been up to for the last 10 years. Um, they've done research on why people do science and why they publish. And this is a slide that I have really overused in, in recent years. And this was published in 99, so 20 odd years ago. And I've been using it ever since uh, in most of my talks that have to deal with authorship um, or, or science or research integrity and research ethics. Basically, we can recognize that there are two large groups of reasons why people perform science and why they publish. Half of them are really selfish, while half of them are what we call the ideal scientist who wants to discuss uh, his views on nature or whatever they're researching. Uh, but half of them is, oh, I want to promote, I want to step ahead in my career. Um, I do it for prestige, I need funding, or any sort of financial reward. So the whys here already tell us that people who do science don't do it universally for, for the greater good or for trying to, to enhance the overall level of knowledge in the world. I would still hope that even those who are selfish do at least a portion of that. But we never know. When we think about the hows, um, there are two large portions of, of, or two large aspects of how research is performed. And that is either uh, research integrity or research ethics. Um, they are different. And the field of research integrity in, in the last 20 years has really exploded. And a whole new, Meta science has evolved from us trying to figure out how um, people adhere to professional standards while performing science. Uh, research ethics, um, including bioethics, has been around for way longer, and it basically deals with moral principles that guide research. And when you have rules, either written or unwritten, you will always have people who cross the lines and do things that are either unethical or uh, basically misconduct. Um, when we had the, the training session for, for the tra Zoom training session for this session, um, we started discussing how if you set any sort of standard or any set sort of rule uh, people will try and game the system. Um, I'm not showing this slide as, uh, as a way of saying that um, scientists and authors have started uh, gaming the system because not most of the countries do not have a system where they quantify, uh, the, only, only quantify the number of publications for advancement in, in one's rank. But what's observable, if you observe this slide, is that uh, the number of authors has dramatically increased over the last 50, 60 years. And if we go further back to the late 1900, early 20th century, uh, yeah, so late, in, late 19th century, early 20th century, uh, the, the number of people 
her uh, her paper goes even further down, very very close to the wall. Part of it is definitely um, the complex aspects of science, where no single person can be a master of all all aspects of research done. But part of it is always um, one has to keep in mind that people like to be authors um, for for those selfish reasons. Uh, how it's it's done is very important. And now we come to how science is reported, um, not how it's published. So how it's reported, we tend to hope that journalists covering um, science do have a scientific education. Occasionally they do. And those uh, scientists who end up being journalists do really nice, a really nice job. But most of the journalists do not have a scientific background. So for them, it's very, very difficult to understand what the even the topic is. And they try to, I'll use a very, very contentious term here, dumb it down. Um, they try to find catchphrases from the research that have been published. And they fail to understand that any piece of research that has been published is not the absolute truth. Uh, it is. It needs to be tested and retested, um, and a whole host of, of problems happen when you try to confirm in a different lab your own results. Um, that has created a, a new meta science trying to uh, to redo. Uh, the results. Uh, started in psychology, but actually moved on to most fields in research. So I, I like this slide because uh, it shows that the journalists that really, if, doesn't, if, if they don't have a scientific background, really struggle with how to transfer the basic idea behind um, what was written in, 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 in a paper. Um, and um, <laughs> Also have this slide that says if if they don't have some understanding of of science and how science works, basically anyone reading those papers thinks that the scientists have finally found cures. Oh, yesterday we found a cure for cancer, you know, into the time machine and stuff like that. Um, and while scientists read these, uh, they approach them with a lot more skepticism. So they know that. Some of it is true. Some of it is uh, true to the best knowledge of those who published it, but most of the results need to be verified and re-verified and to see how well they fit the overall understanding of, of the topic. Um, so to make this, this really, really difficult topic a bit um, lighter, uh, I'm using these memes um, it's incredible any one of us who's ever had to deal with journalists trying to transfer our ideas to lay people only increase the level of miscommunication. And I don't have a problem with misinformation where a piece of information is misinterpreted, but I do have a problem when the information is disinformed, which means actively, um, actively misinformed with a goal to create dissent in in, in And uh, our tools and possible answers to answering these, these things, um, I've said at the beginning that we teach kids in school the basics of science. They start with uh, approaches to nature and geography. They go on to biology, uh, physics, chemistry. None of them doubt those things. None of them doubt math. None of them doubt uh, Pythagoras. And um, what we should actually do better is insist on the kids understanding uh, the hierarchy of, of evidence um, that uh, when they say, I know someone who's been cured 
from cancer by a lady who has, you know, herbs. Um, that's the least level of evidence, and they should understand how to look for the highest level of evidence. Um, so critical thinking uh, should be taught from very, very early on, not to doubt everything around them, but to better understand how the world around them functions and teach them about biases, um, confirmation bias, observation bias. Those biases are really things that influence significantly how, and I'm going to actually say it again, how this uh, pandemic has been understood by most lay people. Um, they think that what they see in their own personal lives translates extremely well to how the pandemic is interpreted um, in, in the world. So while we have to insist that the research that is done is true, there is no misconduct, that, there, that it's fair, so that it, it's ethical, and that uh, researchers understand that they have a public responsibility, there are other tools too that can be used in this goal. And that's it from me. Okay, silence. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, thank you, Vedran, uh, for setting up the scene for our panel. I hope uh, some questions you raised woke up our attendees. And I inv invite all of you to ask questions in our Q&A section and engage in the chat with uh, the speakers and attendees. And now, I would like to announce our esteemed panelists. They all come from Slovenia, but have extensive international working experience. Jana Javornik is an academic at the University of Leeds, Stockholm University, Utrecht University, and the University of Alberta in Canada. For many years, her focus was on equality, diversity, and building sustainable societies. So she spent 10 years as a senior policy advisor for central governments and high profile international organizations, including the European Commission, World Bank and others. From 2019, she served as a director general of higher education in Slovenia, leading Slovenian higher education institutes through the pandemic. Jana serves on several international editorial boards and writes articles for the prominent international news magazine. She's a board member of a number of national and international civil society and academic organizations, and she received an award for her scientific contribution. Our second panelist is Dr. Jana Kolar. She's the executive, hi Anna, she's the executive director of CERIC ERIC, a research infrastructure for characterization of materials and bio biomaterials. Her past commitments included a post in the National and the University Library of Slovenia, as well as the position of director general of science and technology at the ministry in Slovenia, chairman of the board of Slovenian Technology Agency and researchers. Our third panelist is Zaria Mursic. She's a freelance science journalist and a teaching assistant in cognitive science at the University of Ljubljana. She has a background in biology, cognitive science, and evolutionary anthropology. She also co-hosts multiple radio shows about science, and she strongly believes science should be accessible for all people. Our fourth panelist is Professor Gregor Majdic. He has a long and fruitful career, so let me introduce you to some of the highlights. Since 2002, he has been leading a research group at the University of Ljubljana Faculty of Veterinary Medicine, where he also served as vice dean. He also holds a joint position as professor of physiology at the University of Maribor Med Medical School. He has published more than 19 peer review articles, 
work on numerous national and international grants, but he's also very active in promoting science to the general public. So he wrote many popular science articles and published three fiction books. He's a regular guest on radio and television programs about science. Uh, he was also awarded the Slovenian National Prize for the best science communicator. And of course, I must use this opportunity to congratulate him on his newest appointment. In a few weeks, he will be assuming the position of director of the University of Ljubljana. And in the end, the man who gathered all of the panelists and who will steer the discussion. This is Mira Pushnik, the director of the Central Technical Library of the University of Ljubljana. He led projects on setting up and operating the digital library of the University of Ljubljana. And he is the president of the National Council for Libraries of the Republic, uh, Republic of Slovenia. He's a member of the Coalition S Leaders Group and a member of the European Open Science Cloud Rules of Participation Working Group. So Mira, I will uh, give now the word to you and your panel. Okay, uh, thank you Lea for kind introduction and also thanks to the organizers uh, to, uh, for the invitation. Uh, I had to say that I'm very honored to be a part of PubMed conference and especially to be a chair of this panel today. Today, we are talking about a very important uh, topic, which is especially relevant in the time of which we currently live. I mean, and this is trust in science. Thanks to Professor Katanis for great introduction presentation, which gave us many clues for further discussion, I would say. And we can all say that trust is essential for fulfilling the fundamental mission of science, so which is to improve the conditions of social development. Uh, in other words, uh, uh, a scientific endeavor that is not trusted by the public cannot adequately contribute to society and will be diminished as a result. So the COVID pandemic has shown that it's clearly not enough just demand, simply demand that the lay public should trust scientists because they know more and better. So there are many doubts and simplifications uh, which we are faced with uh, of the public attitude towards complex scientific findings. Judging by the level of vaccination, uh, I can I think the level of trust in science is actually very low. So my introduction question addresses all of you, esteemed panelists. What do you think went wrong in this case, actually? Uh, I, I, I will start with, with uh, anyone, uh, but please, uh, uh, free, 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 free to answer. Okay, I'll start then, unless someone else wants to. Yeah, no, go, go ahead. ahead. Okay, go ahead, Jana. Okay, thank you. Um, I've been thinking about this issue quite a lot because um, during the pandemic, I sat in two seats. One was in, in policy and one was in, in academia. So while I was making policy uh, actively, I was also making science actively. Um, and obviously the two often collide uh, because the latter is very often informed by the politics. And politics is usually very constrained by, by a specific uh, socioeconomic context. But in terms of um, the, the big issue, in terms of trust, um, I really do have one, I think, source of all evil, um, and that is called internet. Uh, I think that it was designed for research purposes, right? When, when it was designed back in the, in the 80s. But I think that ever since the society has deviated from, from its intended use and as such many aspects of our daily lives have changed. Um, and I think drastically uh, over the past couple, couple of years. I would say that the many tools that the internet um, has offered have become kind of second nature to us. And at first the net was designed as a plain data transfer network for researchers, uh, but I think it has moved into a more vivid, transforming living network. And I think the evolution of, of um, the internet came with barely foreseeable cultural changes. And I think those affected core elements of our society, including collaboration, government, participation, intellectual property, content, and information as, as a whole. So I think that it's very likely that the way that we as researchers publish, um, assess impact and communicate, but also collaborate um, has and will drastically change uh, due to the pandemic. Um, 
And I think it will change more drastically than it has over the course of the past 200 years. Uh, and I think what's, what's really behind the current changes um, is specifically vivid in the fields of knowledge creation. And I think I think this is where, where um, I think colleague um, Katovic was talking about it as well, is that research is a relatively sensitive process uh, and it's also a very complex process and it has many facets and millions of participants, but also hierarchies, personal networks, structures. And the reason why I think we are facing all those issues is science needs informed participants. And we all are participants in, in, in that respect. So I think this is one of the main culprits uh, is that kind of all people who have never ever have, have had any experience in, in science production um, have all of a sudden had access to, uh, to contributing to science. Thank you. I think it's uh, interesting. <laughs> uh, we basically say the exact same thing only from different viewpoints. Uh, while you are saying that the internet is a problem, I'm saying that understanding or having uh, the ability to crit critically assess um, the, the outside world is a problem. I wouldn't have a problem with internet and complete democracy if everyone had a basic concept of of understanding what bias meant and how, how to interpret data. Um, but I think one of the, one of the best examples um, that I've had in recent months of how people interpret the world is they consider every piece of information as final fact. And there was a video of a guy driving to a drive-through to get coffee. And he was explaining how he was really stressed because um, he said, by driving there, I can definitely find information. He says information because he doesn't look for, for the hierarchy of, of validity. Um, that drinking coffee can cause blindness. And then he searches Google and finds uh, a piece of information that says, yes, if you drink more than eight cups of coffee, uh, you might go blind. And then he says, but I'm sure that there is information that says that drinking coffee can be good for your eyesight. And yes, he Googles that piece of information and finds that yes, drinking coffee may improve your eyesight. So how the public sees facts is they consider that these are of equal value and say, oh, if there is research that says that drinking coffee can cause blindness and there is research that shows that drinking coffee can improve your vision, they are of equal validity and they cancel each other out. It doesn't work that way or it shouldn't work that way. But for the public, it, it feels that, that that's how the world works and that researchers don't know what they're doing and uh, they don't grasp uh, the fact that, you know, Performing research is just a way of getting closer to the truth. Oh. But not, I don't think we should blame democracy or, or the internet. You know, it's just a tool that has shown us how poorly we perform at a more basic level. If, yeah, I would. Okay, okay. yeah. Yeah. yeah, if I can add to this discussion, because I really think, well, uh, the, the public gets information from media and internet. Uh, throughout the, uh, the recent decades, the main information about science for public was uh, television. And it was extremely important for public trust in science, how television was communicating science and false reporting, especially uh, false balances, especially when it comes to climate change was extremely important. Um, uh, important issue. Now, with the development of internet, it's in several countries already the main uh, source of information regarding science. And scientists started uh, looking into the relevance, uh, how this impacts public trust in science. And there are actually several papers that say that it has beneficial effect on how uh, public uh, uh, trust, on, on the public trust of science. Of course, you can also find some papers saying the opposite, but the fact is that 
our, uh, the population uh, uh, is not prepared for all the information that we find on the internet, also scientific information. Also considering the biases that are natural to our existence, for example, uh, some were all already mentioned by Vedran. The fact is that we are inclined to reinforce, to find information on the internet, which will reinforce our beliefs. So in case of coffee, for example, we are more likely to look for the in, uh, on the internet. If we think that it's bad for our sight, uh, eyesight, we are more likely to look, uh, to look for the information that will reinforce this belief than uh, the opposite. And then it will, in a way, we will start communicating to the others that that is actually the fact. And since uh, society is not trained, in my opinion, enough and familiar enough with the scientific uh, methods and uh, also how uh, the, the processes behind the uh, scientific developments, it is often then confused. This shows, for example, also in Slovenia. Slovenia, uh, looking at the uh, share of population with a high uh, level of education, uh, it's one of the top in Europe, but when it comes to uh, the statement, I will never be vaccinated, it's with 20%, with a share of 20% of people that says I'll never get vaccinated, which also, you know, indicates the trust in science in this case. We are um, second worst uh, to Bulgaria. So there, there's clearly uh, a very strong impact of this uh, modern ways of communication on the impact of science. And uh, we are not dealing well with this. Thank you. Uh, can, can I yeah. add? Yeah, Zaria. First of all, thank you for the invite to this uh, great um, talk, this great panel. And um, I'm going to speak from a point of view of a journalist, actually, of a science journalist with a scientific background, actually. Uh, so, yeah, I'm a biologist by training. But I think um, the first thing I think, Miro, you asked um, whether um, this vaccine hesitancy or vaccine confidence has to do with trust in science. I think it has to do a lot with our trust in institutions, especially in Slovenia. I think our institutions of public health and also science in a sense of like university lost trust of people. So it's not so much as a science um, as the way we gain knowledge, but it's more about the institutions that lost trust. And um, secondly, people are not really guided by um, when we take risks and when we account for difference in the data that we see that it's more, it's clearly safer to take vaccine than to get infected with COVID. Even so I am young and I, nothing might happen if I get COVID, but it's much safer if I meet COVID once I already met uh, the spike protein via vaccination. Um, and, but people actually operate on, on emotions. So they make decisions about vaccinations, um, accounting emotions. And these two emotions that are very strong now, especially in Slovenia, I think it's one is anger, as we could see a few days ago when we had big protests, and the second one is fear. And if somebody gives you the information, like Vedran mentioned in his lecture, like, oh, my friend got epileptic attacks after getting COVID vaccine, even so it might, it probably wasn't connected, it's not causal relationship, it was just coincidence. People will really, really, oh, my friend now has an issue because of vaccination, they will do this causal uh, relationship inference instead of just understanding that it just might happen by chance. And we'll not look at the big data that basically with vaccines, we already saved more than hundreds of thousands of lives um, that would be taken with COVID. So yeah, we need, to, we need to take emotions of people into account. And then the next one I would like to add is that maybe when we communicate science, we don't talk enough about the values of scientists, the values that scientists have, the values that they, um, they present, that they present themselves to, to the public. We just talk about, okay, they're scientists, they do this job, they, they gather data, they, they analyze the data, they interpret it in their small bubble, small scientific bubble, but they are also people, they are also part of this community and science in itself is a social process. And I think we can really see that in, in the States, we have a great example of the one of the, um, the researchers who are part of Moderna vaccine, Kismikia Corbett. She's a black researcher. Uh, she's now a Harvard professor. I think she got a tenure check in Harvard. And she did a huge, he, she had a huge impact on the black communities in the States when it comes to vaccine acceptance, because we, we need this 
diversity in science. We need to have different voices in science and that kind of scientists need to present their science and also be part of these big um, things that happen. And that's how you gain trust um, in science um, from people that are around you. And I mean, blaming internet for what's happening right now, I, I'm not sure because we know, I mean, especially when it comes to vaccine. Yeah, internet, I, I totally agree with, I think what Diana said that we get so many information, we're basically bombarded with information. We don't know what to take in, what, what to make out of this. Sometimes we are just completely overwhelmed with all these things. Um, and, um, but I think what's more important is that since, since the first time that vaccines were developed, that was vaccine hesitancy. So like the start of vaccine had vaccine hesitancy and low vaccine confidence already in it. And we have plenty of movements throughout the history that were um, like organizing protests against vaccines. So it's not, it's not a simple answer how to, and it's not just about science, it's about a, a whole society and how we um, deal with one another and what our relationships in the world are, so. Thank you. Maybe Gregor, some comments on oh. this. Yeah, maybe I will just add a few words. I agree what was said before, but uh, I will make two comments. I think the process is actually much longer than the internet and especially social media. It started 20, 30 years ago with the mistress of science. And I think especially in the 90s, there was some kind of dichotomy between the general public and the science. A lot of scientists at that time thought, oh, the science is too complicated to explain it to general public. And we somehow lost this contact with the general public and then, uh, and the clear example for this, these are GMOs, which was a similar discussion in the 90s. Uh, and then the NGOs with the, their own agenda against something, they moved into this empty space between science and the general public. Uh, so I call it, I think it's just the culmination or the pinnacle of this process that's been much longer, but was of course uh, sped up and uh, enforced by the internet and by the social media, which also applied to the emotions, as Daria said, in called the post like this, uh, they promote it on the Facebook, Twitter, and other social media, and they uh, achieve much stronger reaction in the people. Uh, I also see the COVID pandemic from the media point of view, and there are, of course, some good exemption from that, but in general, as a lost uh, opportunity to increase the awareness of science. For example, at the beginning of the COVID pandemic, I remember in Slovenia, there was a lot of discussion, uh, a lot of uh, People who don't understand science were saying, oh, you can see the science is not working, it's changing every day what they say about the virus. But the, we should at that time, we should inform people that this is science, science is learning all the time. Science is not a dogma, it's changing, it's learning new things and it's adapting. And that is the basic premise of the science and people don't understand that. And that was a great opportunity to show them that. Uh, also, another example, for some time, there were people explaining that 13,000 people died in Europe because of the COVID vaccination. And uh, as we probably all know, what was that data? It was the data from post-marketing surveillance, which uh, monitors all the deaths after certain events, after vaccination, for example, and compares that with uh, deaths in unvaccinated population. And nobody explained to people, at least I didn't see much explanation, what this number actually means, that these are all the people who were hit by the car one day after the vaccination, people who had terminal cancer when they were vaccinated, and etc. And so from that point of view, I think it was also a lost opportunity, not just a problem. Thank you. Uh, now we have uh, some great uh, cues uh, to, uh, for further discussion. Maybe I, I will follow Zaria's comment on uh, the role of uh, public organizations um, in, 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 a, in a communication with, with a society. Uh, and uh, for me, what is particularly unusual is that this mistrust uh, actually is often supported by the attitude of society's leading political structure towards science. I mean, not only lack of communication strategy, but also, also, um, uh, also let's say, um, uh, in Slovenia, for example, uh, and globally, both we are faced with populist and scientifically completed, uh, unstated assumptions. Uh, for example, regarding the climate catastrophe, uh, I think last year, the last three years, we, we are going with some uh, politics here in, here in our government. And uh, is it not perhaps the dynamics of emerging crisis and the speed of discoveries that are changing the planet an opportunity and also, in other hand, a demand for, uh, let's say, a reintegration of researchers uh, into mainstream policy making, as was the case in the past during post-Second World Development, for example. What do you think? Maybe, Zaria, if you 
comment because yeah I, I can i can start yeah um so i recently uh, did an interview i mean two days ago uh, it hasn't been published yet unfortunately with the scientific advisor from foreigner office in the uk um she is an astrophysicist actually she's a working researcher um but she also guides this group of people who give scientific advice to to british government and what i found really interesting what I what I gather from this talk is basically uh, she's been put there on this position before the pandemic started. She had no idea that she's going to deal with the pandemic, but she stayed there even so she's an astrophysicist. They didn't search for epidemiology suddenly and change the whole group. No, the whole group stayed the same. But they did have small groups that will deal with epidemiology, we deal with the crisis that we have now with pandemic. And she also said that they have a long term history of this kind of scientific advisor that comes from the Second World War, as you just mentioned, actually. And I mean, when I when I think about it in in terms of Slovenia, which is a younger country, then uh, we don't have this tradition. We don't have this 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 um, kind of um, yeah tradition and a, like a long term thing that we know of that we have scientific advisors who are there just in case this happens or if there is like flooding or if there is something else. They gather a team that can deal with this. And the important thing from the conversation is also that they are scientists. They gather the evidence. They translate evidence for policymakers. They don't do policy. They don't present policy but they just gather the data and they also speak about uncertainties. They say, for this, we are, we are highly certain that it's like that. For this, we have no clue what's happening. And they say that also to general public. But the, the next thing that ha happens after we don't know what's happening is, but we are doing this and this and this to try to find out what's happening. So they, they reassure the public that they are working on it, even so that currently they don't know. So I think that is also this talking about uncertainties that's missing. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to finish here, maybe add some more uh, later and Jana can can follow yeah we have two Jana here. Oh, to Jana, 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 Jana G, Jana <laughs> Key, so Jana Key, please well yes uh, it brings us back to which institutions do uh, do people trust and also in the latest uh, Eurobarometer regarding the vaccines it was very clear that uh, they will trust experts uh, and uh, the the trust in experts was the highest uh, while the trust in uh, basically uh, government and politicians was rated the lowest. Um, and it brings us to uh, exactly what Zaria was saying. Uh, one, I think that one of the reasons we have uh, uh, for mistrust in Slovenia is that we do not have the scientific advisory mechanism or the uh, scientific advisory panel as they do in some other uh, in some other democracies. For example, UK was mentioned here, and it's true throughout the pandemic they are there. You see Boris Johnson. There's Valens sitting, uh, standing next to him, uh, also sometimes saying that what uh, correcting Boris Johnson just. Uh, it gives, uh, it enhances credibility in what is stated um, in, in the eyes of the public. Now, um, in, on European level, we do have also a mechanism. Uh, it's a group of scientists which are supported by the expert reports produced by the academies in Europe. Now, academies, of course, is also one good way of communicating science. Uh, because basically it, they bring together all across Europe uh, the, the best scientists. Um, uh, and a Slovenian academy um, sometimes does offer, an, uh, does voice opinion, and they have also asked people to accept vaccinations. However, as this is not really um, embedded in our society, because it happens uh, rarely, it's uh, underexploited basically. Not many people registered this. So we, we basically need a much stronger and also institutionalized advice of scientists, not just some great communicators such as, for example, uh, Roman Yerala that uh, continuously um, reports on the scientific outcome, uh, outcomes in a way that also public will understand. Okay. Uh... Jana J, yeah, <laughs> please. Thank you. Um, I actually wanted to make the exact same point about the role of scientists and, and the traditional role of us sitting in the ivory tower uh, of science. And this is also the, I think, the issue of, of the language. And very often the scientists uh, we tend to use our obscure language that only we understand. So we need someone who translates the language. Um, to what we call lay audience who are 
usually highly in uh, intelligent, but they aren't necessarily experts. And also the language that we've adopted is, is, the, distinct, is the distinction between the experts and the scientists. So some groups, some countries um, actually hire scientists and use and adopt the language throughout. And throughout the pandemic, they have been using this quite continuously and, and um, cohesively in terms of these are the scientific groups. Whereas some other languages have been relying on experts. Uh, and obviously there's a very not, there's a very fine distinction between the two, but experts aren't necessarily scientists. And I think this is crucial in, in some of the countries uh, that seem to be quite reluctant uh, to the uptake of a vaccine, um, where experts um, have been very much politicized or at least perceived as being the, the extension of the political um, uh, of the political party. And in 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 the countries that that we've raised, that we've used so far, like uh, Slovenia, I'm not so much familiar with Croatia, so the colleagues can 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 uh, add to that. Uh, the UK, but also Sweden. I think these are three entirely different uh, representations of how science has been used and how scientists have been uh, have been used. And also, there's there's one thing when when I'm talking about the language, I think we all slightly have different. Uh, understanding of what um, science communicator means and obviously I when I when I communicate my own my own research I'm not a scientist a, sci a science communicator I'm just self-plugging I'm reporting my results I'm making them them openly and publicly available whereas someone who really does science communication uh, is what Vedran says does the highest skills of intellectual capacity and that is synthesizes the multiplicity of information that's available, not necessarily their own, uh, brings them together. Uh, also, all the negatives, all the challenges are being brought together and then um, repackaged and translated so that people do understand. And I think this is where we as scientists often go wrong. We assume that everyone who enters the conversation has the same background, has the same level of understanding, has the same disciplinary level um, of depth. Uh, and obviously, things get lost in, in, in translation. And also, um, I would also like to, to, as I'm apparently stirring up debates today um, and bringing up different perspectives, I'd also like to say that the, that the management of the pandemic wasn't all about the vaccine. It all started with the, with the mismanagement and bad management um, last year. Uh, it all started basically back in, in December when uh, students from China and colleagues from China were starting their mobility uh, into Europe. Um, and I think that kind of caused the, the, the rise of racism, xenophobia, uh, and very often informed, particularly in the more populist countries, um, such as many of the Eastern European countries, are really huge kind of like uh, restrictions, uh, also closing down the, the borders for all the wrong reasons, not only to protect the entry of the virus, but also of people who may be carrying the virus. Thank you. Maybe Gregor. Uh... Uh, yeah, maybe I will add to this international comparison. I think it's very interesting when you look at the uh, rate of vaccination between different countries in Europe, and there is a clear divide between East and West, not be only between the countries, but also within the Germany. You can see a clear divide that uh, Eastern parts of Germany are much less vaccinated, much lower rate. I think there is another reason to that, just to the scientific. I'm not a social scientist, but I think there is a prob general problem with the society that 30 years ago, when we changed the system, uh, we removed the authorities that were abused in the previous system. But then when we adopted a new system, we did not adopt that we need some authorities to trust to, for the society to work. And uh, a lot of people in these countries think that democracy is absolute freedom, which is not. Democracy is a set of rules that are needed for the society for, to function. And I think this is now becoming clear in the COVID epidemics when we do not want to trust any authorities and uh, we are promoting individualism and things like that. Maybe Anna can correct me as a social scientist, but that's my observation. Thank you. Uh, it's very interesting. Uh, for example, according to the World Economic Forum survey, people in India have the most trust in science. Uh, there are no specific patterns and causes for this. I mean, let's say Taiwan, Singapore and Japan, uh, for example, rank the lowest on the scale. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, very interesting column geography of vaccination published by Sasha Dulens last week in his blog, Quarkadabra, shows that in Europe there is a strong dividing line between Western and Eastern countries. 
in the terms of trust in science in the case of uh, in case of vaccination so what do you think could be the cause for such results uh, in this regard i mean which 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 uh, uh, are uh, let's say impacts to 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 influence such, such strong on on such uh, 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 let's say dif differences between uh, some countries or, or regions If I may, I've been raising my hand for a while. Uh, Absolutely, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah I didn't. So I, I just wanted to add a further a further pint of oil to this fire. Um, regarding vaccinations, um, what we are seeing now is basically something that has been brewing for a while, that has been exposed by the Wakefield, I would say, scandal when he used. Um, uh, fake data to promote his own agenda. And he was romanticized by a lot of people as a person who was fighting the system for the little man who was trying to fight for their right not to be vaccinated because of all the autism that these vaccines were causing. Um, of course, none of the anti-vaxxers want to admit it, but now that they are resisting vaccinations, um, as well as so many people that have been vaccinated, the level of autism hasn't changed, but that is how they approach, um, th that is their worldview. And by romanticizing this idea that they need a hero that fights for a man against the system, um, especially works in, I would say, in systems where there is greater social injustice. I hope that I haven't killed the conversation. May I add to your question, Miro? Yeah, absolutely. You the difference between the countries, your example between Asian countries, India, Japan, Taiwan, Singapore, I think you have uh, countries at two different levels of the development. Uh, India, although it's progressing rapidly in recent years, it's still a lot big parts of India are very poorly developed and the other three countries are very well developed. I think there is also a line between developed and undeveloped countries. Countries that are undeveloped and still uh, having problems with basic issues such as hunger, uh, infectious diseases, that kids are dying from infectious diseases, they are much more readily accepting science than countries where we came to the different level and forgot what was the hunger, what were the infectious diseases when people, uh, kids died from infectious diseases. I remember a few years ago, uh, one of my colleagues, my previous PhD student, who is now active in Europa Dona, was uh, reporting to me that she was at the oncological conference, and uh, there was a physician from Ghana, and he said he almost cried at the uh, podium and said that you are now talking here about the biological drugs that are cost costing 50, 100,000 euros, we would be just happy to have vaccines so not half of our kids would die before two years of age. So I think part of the an answer to your question is this divide between developed and undeveloped world. People who do not have access to drinking water, uh, where people are still dying from various causes, they trust in science because they know it could change their lives. And we think that uh, our good lives, easy lives are just something normal that uh, not, cannot be taken away. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, some other comments? I think Jana J is waiting for her. Okay, okay, Jana J. As is, as is, as is Jana K. <laughs> yeah, no. uh, uh, just, just one thing to, uh, to, to build on what has been said. I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't use that um, divide. I don't think you know, it, it's a level of, of, of development or industrialization of the country that really explains that. Obviously, that explains the access to, uh, because it comes from, from, from the accessibility issue. It raises the accessibility issue. Um, but what's been slightly neglected is that societies are very diverse. Some societies are homogenous, some and, and some societies just aren't. And even in the UK, where the vaccination uptake has been one of the highest, if not the highest, um, 
we've neglected that there are parts of the society that just, you know, didn't have access to the vaccination, but not because the NHS hasn't provided it, because the, the society is so structured and stratified, it just didn't, they didn't get the memo, if that makes sense. So I'm, I'm obviously illustrating here. And there are parts of societies that have been left behind during the pandemic. And we focused on, on some default uh, uh, demographic profile and neglected a lot of other groups. Um, and I think that comes up on the, on the aggregate level uh, and shows in, in different metrics. Uh, in terms of um, Asian uh, societies that you've mentioned, obviously I would go and play the cultural card as well. Uh, and there is a bit more, I wouldn't even use the term trust into government, it's just how societies operate. Um, whereas we have much opener, uh, much more open societies in the weird countries, the so Western uh, educated uh, industrialized countries. Um, and in that group, I think we've seen, uh, we've seen the rise of, of individualism as well. Uh, so I wouldn't blame it on the internet. I wouldn't blame it on the teachers. I wouldn't blame it on the science. It's a whole complex of, uh, of, of issues and causes um, that have raised that. Thank you. Uh, Jana? Yes, okay. uh, so this discussion is uh, much better suited for social scientists and I'm natural scientist, so I know my limitations here. Uh, but uh, coming back to the uh, discussion of the case of Wakefield, which uh, published in Lancet uh, the, uh, that uh, certain vaccinations are linked to increased rate of autism. Now, um, the, this is still, uh, this is still very strongly uh, mentioned uh, and found all across internet, despite the fact that it was actually a fraud and uh, the uh, Wakefield uh, was uh, discredited as academic and it was struck out of the medical register for it and the paper was retracted. But this, this while science has mechanisms to uh, find out what are the uh, fraudulent, uh, 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 to find out fraudulent research and has a possibility to retract papers. Science is not, uh, uh, society is not on board with this. They do not know the mechanism of how science works well enough. And as a result, there's always, uh, there's also sometimes a uh, reference to this uh, scientist fighting the conspiracy theory in, in science and uh, backed up by, I don't know, pharmaceutical companies and so on. And that really is based also on the misunderstanding of the scientific method, in my opinion, but I'm a natural scientist. Perfect, thank you. Uh, maybe Zaria, you have some comments on this or? Um, no, not really. I mean, okay. I would just, I would just maybe mention that we are, we are speaking from a position of a power of a knowledge that we have, that we are lucky enough to, to do PhDs um, and to have this knowledge that we have. So, I think one of the things I learned throughout the last year uh, reporting on pandemic is never underestimate uh, anyone, any, any, any people with no matter what education they have, they can understand science, they can understand. Uh, we just need to 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 adapt adapt and also listen to them and their questions so i think i would just add that and that that when it comes to vaccine i'm very i actually don't know about this study from world economic forum so it's really hard for me to comment because i don't know how it was done and how they checked the trust in science so so i i i, I wouldn't comment on that but i would say that i i'm really deeply disappointed in this world when I see that the majority of the world actually doesn't have access to vaccines and we are talking about third doses for young people. So this is really quite a big thing that's on my mind lately. Thank you. Um, maybe if you allow me just one little comment and then uh, we go with another interesting question, but about Wakefield Va uh, case. Um, for me, the most important issue and the most problematic issue is that it, this article was published in Lancet. And this shows uh, uh, on importance uh, of peer review in science communication. I mean, for, I, I'm talking about transparent peer review systems. Yesterday, I studied uh, Open Research Europe's uh, platform and there is a open peer review and I'm sure that in case, in, in, in such case, um, 
uh, couldn't be couldn't be uh, uh, happened uh, uh, if if uh, let's say open peer review or, or transparent peer review were organized as as uh, it's needed. So we are talking about Lancet, one one of the most impact. I mean, one of the most influent uh, journal uh, uh, in scientific uh, society. Uh, I'm sorry for this, but yeah, uh, it, this is really. Uh, uh, let's say uh, it was i mean this is really a problem uh, but the, the next question i will start with one comment from from the audience uh, and it is written by adranka it looks to me there are two main reasons uh, for mistrust in science the most controversial scientists one to two percent occupy more than 90 percent of media scientific content and two uh, the second second point is normal scientists are not educated to communicate uh, properly with the public and traditionally media are not interested uh, in normal scientists. Uh, I mean, this is a point uh, because um, I think surely the deficit of this mistrust is also an obstacle uh, in resolving the coming crisis, such threatening climate change, insecurity in the provision of food, water, etc, etc. And what is for me um, important is how how to strengthen the trust between science and society needed to overcome the coronavirus as well as to address the looming problems they may be even more crucial so uh, researchers often talk about methods therefore what methods to use to involve various representatives of societies in the dialogue with researchers especially i would say those who have been maybe ignored or marginalized or harmed by scientific progress as we see now, I think these people now are, are uh, on, on streets. Uh, uh, so uh, how, how to do that? Uh, how, how, how to approach to these people and how to start talk, uh, talk with them? I mean, how, how to set this dialogue? So maybe uh, Jana, uh, G, uh, raise the hand, please go ahead. I think Leah had her hand raised before. Oh, yeah, Leah. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, I didn't see. Then Leah, please. Uh, no problem, Mira. I just wanted to do uh, the same as you did and uh, read through some of the questions from our audience. Uh, uh -huh, OK, continue. OK. OK. Then okay. Jan, yeah. Thank you. Um, very often, the, the, the current crisis um, reminds me of Brexit. And also why Trump trumped in the US. It's um, we have so many voices neglected and we have had them through the times. As Zaria said, we talk from the power of knowledge and we use the language of the distance. Um, it's very difficult to, to, to approach, um, excuse my popular use of language, the masses. And those, and, and, and we've seen, and, and I would really link this to the rise of populism um, throughout Europe and, and, and the US, it's um, they know how to connect. They know how to talk. They know how to translate um, complex ideas into um, single sentences that are ridiculously short. And obviously we as scientists, we haven't been trained in that. Uh, we, have, we haven't been trained in communicating um, what we really do uh, with passion and, and translating that into a very plain, um, under, easily understood language. And that really, like, like why Brexit um, came about is also a huge disappointment for social science because uh, in the UK, social science has not predicted Brexit referendum. We did not say Brexit will go through. Uh, and yet it, it, it won by margin, uh, I think 0.4%. Uh, and that's, you know, that's the irony. Uh, and I think the pandemic really is a wake up call um, and especially to social sciences um, to, to, to revise the theories and, and build new ones that actually are more um, relatable and, and explain what's happening. Thank you, Jana. Um, yes, uh, coming to exactly this discussion about uh, Brexit and again, from the point of view of natural scientists. Now, um, Zaria earlier mentioned what I think is very relevant for this, that uh, when you, your argument appeal em, uh, on most of the population or the fact uh, or any facts are secondary. And it's very difficult to win in this kind of arguments. And we absolutely need more social scientists 
and uh, social sciences to look into it uh, for the society to be better prepared for it. Um, basically, um, I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't want in any uh, way to speak from the let's say position of knowledge or someone that knows. Uh, but I think that we also need to identify what are the main uh, issues in, with the society or misunderstandings or uh, in order basically to build on that. Uh, so what uh, we can do, for example, I'm uh, executive director of research infrastructure and uh, to particularly address uh, some of the gaps in this respect, we're running six weeks courses for high school pupils to introduce them to scientific methods from the design to the publication to uh, setting up of um, uh, spin-offs if uh, companies if that is of relevance uh, and we at the end uh, through the question you also assess whether their understanding of how science work have changed and for example whether uh, there's more people interested in studying stem and the results are quite encouraging but i really think that educational system should uh, play a role in this as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Vedran, your hand is raised, I think so. Uh, uh, please, if you, if you turn mic microphone. Oh, yes, thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm just happy that <laughs> all of us agree on so many things and they all come down to the whys and hows. Uh, that we have, that I've proposed at the beginning of my, my talk. But there is one thing that I think is also key, and I keep saying this exact same word. Um, we have the privilege to do things that we love. Um, and we should try to gap this divide that has been artificially introduced between um, scientists and experts on one side and lay people are on the other side. I think that we are, what they say, we're in this together. Uh, we're in this boat together. No, we're, we're in the same storm together, but we have very, very different coping mechanisms because we have a different understanding of, of the world. And I think that there are ways of us reaching out to, to close this gap uh, with the general public. And once we improve that, I think, I think all of this is just a phase. Um, like so many things that have happened in, throughout history uh, where extremism has happened, uh, it's just a sign curves. I'm hoping that by doing the basic things that we always prefer doing, <laughs> teaching, um, will eventually lead to a greater, greater height and greater understanding of, of the outside world. Okay. Can I just add uh, just quickly? Absolutely. Please. First, th one thing is that uh, what you said, Amiro, I think it's really important. You said dialogue. It needs to be a dialogue. It, 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 it's not teaching or uh, somebody, but it's a dialogue between two people or between different groups of people. And the second thing is that uh, we talk about scientists and lay public. I think I'm a lay person when it comes to speaking with Jana Javornik, let's say, because she's a social scientist, she's a sociologist, and I'm a biologist. And I, I was never taught, uh, okay, maybe a little bit in high school about sociology, but I'm a lay person when I speak to her about her topic or when she speaks to me about her topic. The same goes if I speak with, anthrop with social anthropologists, with... Um, I don't know, with economists at the end of the day, I'm the lay person. So it's not, it's not so easy. We are, we are diverse. We, we contain multitudes. We are not just like, a, I'm a scientist and I'm a lay, I can be a scientist and a lay person at the same time, just depending on the field. Okay, thanks. Maybe Gregor, uh, maybe question about the role of, let's say, collaboration of univers universities with, with local communities. How can universities at, uh, let's say, to step toward uh, uh, local community and maybe uh, set uh, let's say a dialogue uh, with what what principles can we can we follow and use uh, in, in this regard uh, i think the universities must open much more into the society i think especially if looking at our university i think in the last few years it was very closed uh, 
there are some people who are inclined to communicate science and they were communicating science but as institution as a general as the largest in academic institution in Slovenia it was not uh, public expressing the opinion a different matter so I think that should change universities are part of the society they were throughout the history and they should fulfill their role so I will try to make University of Ljubljana much more active uh, if I can add to Zaria comment I completely agree with what Zaria said of course I am a life scientist I know a little bit also about the vaccines but I could never not talk about law or economics or anything but uh, what we see today also in the COVID is that a lot of people who are educated who have a good education maybe even PhDs they think they can comment on everything we had another really good example in Slovenia on Saturday when in one major newspaper Delo there was an article about uh, law aspects of uh, compulsory vaccination uh, it was commented by our professor he made very good comments uh, according to the law at the same time in another newspaper which here which is uh, published in maribor there was an article by somebody from the uh, court some uh, lawyer and he was writing that this would be unconstitutional uh, and he was not arguing with the law argument but he was analyzing medical papers and saying from the medical papers that this disease is not dangerous so this is be, be unconstitutional and i think that's a very big problem because we are not sticking to our specialities but we think that we are all specialists for all field of science yes thank you and um yeah talking about those methods how to how to approach wider community i think uh that open science could play one of the key roles uh, in let's say rebuilding trust we talk about uh we're talking about open publications repositories sharing and reusable uh, reusability research data um, citizen science open education resources uh, all those can certainly lead to lasting benefits for the public good um I would like to ask you all for a short comment on this and after especially I would like to ask Zaria to briefly uh, present one very interesting uh, I, I, I can say uh, citizen science project uh, COVID-19 tracer which was created in Slovenia during the pandemic and it, it could be kind of uh, let's say a good uh, good practice uh, how to set such uh, such a project uh, so please first maybe a short comment uh, on uh, role of open science, especially citizen science, maybe, or, or let's say uh, open publications, repositories, etc. And then after, uh, maybe uh, Zaria will share some, some, some uh, inf information about uh, COVID-19 tracer. Um, I will start maybe with Jana. Uh, Jana J has her. Jay has, uh, yeah, okay, uh, rest yes. hand, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, Jana. Um, I really wanted to mention from, from, the, from the position of an ex-director general of higher education, I think it's really important we reconceptualize lifelong learning and it doesn't apply only to Slovenia, I think it applies across the world. Um, it's so many skills and competencies are left uh, for people to, to, to get and learn at the level of a higher education. It's too late. Um, and I think that's going back to Vedran's point, but I wouldn't blame the teachers, I would blame the educational system, which is incredibly old fashioned, it's incredibly rigid, and it's definitely not suited for the 21st century or for the, for the, for the new generations, for the generation Alpha and generation Z. They learn in an entirely different way. So before we actually, obviously I believe, I genuinely believe in common, um, common license in, in all those open mechanisms, in open science, but we've seen what happens when people who are not skilled in, they don't have data literacy, they don't have uh, the skills to, to really critically um, use this information and then use it and launch it for, uh, you know, in, in, in good faith and, and for good reasons, uh, the disaster happens. So I think one lesson for, for, for the policy, I would say, is really go and reform the educational system because it's definitely not fit for the 21st century needs. Thank you. Jana? Yes, just uh, adding to this. Uh, first, answering to your question, uh, open science. Well, yes, we need to dem uh, democratize science. I very strongly believe in that. We need uh, science sometimes comes across and scientists as living in their... Uh, ivory tower uh, being convinced that that is the only right way and not sharing or discussing with the society, which is extremely, in my opinion, it's wrong. Open science is going to contribute to that. 
citizen science is going to contribute uh, to that. We need absolutely need more dialogue to overcome the current problems. And the second one, I would like to uh, voice a huge support to what just uh, Jana just said. I think lifelong learning is a necessity. Thank you. Increased, uh, completely reformulated. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Gregor, maybe your point. Uh, yeah, I will add to your question about the open science. Open science is, uh, of course, a great idea, free exchange of the ideas and the results. But uh, in the context that you mentioned, I think it also has its dangers. Because if we just open the scientific articles without educating people to understand them, we will run into the problems. Citizen science is different. It's very important to addressing these problems. But just open science, it's not an answer. Uh, the example that I gave at the beginning about these people dying af after COVID vaccine is example of such open science. These are open data that's available on the internet, and now the people who are opposing vaccines came to this data and they are misusing it, or perhaps a lot of people just don't under understand it. So it definitely has to go together with the education of the people so they will understand, because not everybody is able to understand a uh, scientific paper when it Okay, so it's 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 uh, I'll do open science uh, gives a lot of opportunities to to access information. Researchers are responsible to translate this information, let's say, to common language or something that that uh, people will understand uh, uh, in, in correct way. Uh, yeah, uh, Zaria, I, I, yeah, please, please. Oh, Lea, Lea, Lea has some. Uh, yeah, Lea, Lea has some. I, I'm sorry, I I, I can't control Lea has rest hand. Yeah, please. Um, we have an excellent example uh, from uh, our attendees. Uh, one of the attendees asked if different conspiracy theories and rumors also contributed to the mistrust in science. And I think that uh, these uh, theories uh, do everything that you uh, said that, uh, that um, scientists should do. So they uh, have experienced communicators, they uh, talk in simple language, uh, they use heroes who fight against the system, and, uh, I, and of course they play on emotions. I think an important point is also that a lot of conspiracy theorists, and especially anti-vaccination movement, are funded. Uh, they have huge funds, and we, we shouldn't forget about that. It's not that people are just on the street um, shouting at the anti-vaccine. For the same went for Brexit, as Jana mentioned before. There was a huge funding campaign against uh, against uh, so for um, exiting the European Union. Um, okay. Um, uh, can I can I have like three minutes just to to introduce Absolutely, you? Absolutely. Okay. I would I would share screen just so people can see because um, mm -hmm. I think not everyone. Um... So do you see now? Mm -hmm. I hope you see the right thing. Uh, the Slidinik page. <laughs> Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, I'm a member of Slidinik. This is, um, um, and Jana is as well, actually, Jana Javernik. And this is, um, it's, um, it's, I don't know, citizen initiative that started in the beginning of pandemic last year in March. Um, the founder was Luka Rinko. Um, he started collecting data about uh, COVID just on his own in one Google sheet. And he, 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 he he was in touch with some other people, some of his friends who, who then started doing that together and there were developers coming in and they said, okay, why don't we just make a page to present this data? Because uh, there, there was basically a mess in Slovenia and Slovenia wasn't the only one that wasn't prepared for, for data um, management and also presentation of data to the public. I mean, maybe some of you know the example of the, in the United States of America, even the Atlantic team has actually did a similar COVID tracker uh, for, the, for the data. Um, there. Um, so yeah, so they they somehow managed to get in touch with the in the beginning with the labs who were doing the COVID testing and with the hospitals who were treating the patients to get this data. And um, at the end, now we have basically a data. Um, how do you call that? Um, like we have a setup, uh, this this um, way the data comes in. Uh, I lost the word uh, for it, um, and uh, we we get it from the national from the from the National Health Institute and from different hospitals as well as for mini from Ministry for Education, Science and and Sport from Slovenia for the data about the uh, um, the situation in schools. Um, and what do we do? We we basically make sure that all this data is available for anyone to use on GitHub. 
and we also um, present it in a in a nice way so anyone can make informed decisions about let's say um, I don't know here we have a regional map of what the situation is in what municipality in Slovenia and then this means that people can actually adjust their risks uh, based on their environment how much COVID is there um, I hope they do that I'm not sure if they do that but uh, this is like the aim uh, the aim of it why do we do it it's to inform public about the situation with COVID but also I think that once we we enable people to see the data um, this can also strengthen the compliance with the measurements or with the restrictions and explain to people what actually happening uh, currently and we would like to see that in the future in Slovenia we have more of uh, data driven policy making as well which we need to understand I think it was mentioned before that data is not everything um, these data especially COVID data those are these numbers are actually people behind it people who might suffer who might go to hospital because of it who might suffer with long COVID and we need to understand that it's not just numbers it's also people and it's really important that we create content also for for people who follow us so we try to do that through social media through medium posts and also interpret the data because um like i don't know some of you might know that even the case definition of who is a COVID uh positive case changed throughout the pandemic and there are different rules about that so it's really important to also to not just have the data have open data and present the data but also to give context to this data and that's true for any data that exists um and yeah in the future we might also start showing uh, data on uh, climate change actually um, and yeah, if anyone has any questions regarding to that, um, I'm happy to answer. I hope that that's uh, that's that's okay, and it's it's clear what what we do and what we stand for. Oh, thank you. Uh, I I I put a, a, a web address uh, to chat, so everyone is able maybe to to check this. I I have to say, I mean, I, it's it's really it's really a great project, uh, and have to. Uh, also uh, be very uh, clear uh, it's not funded by public means i mean everything is funding by those uh, volunteers enthusiasts uh, which are running this uh, uh, project now uh, there are some some information that maybe some other uh, some other problems will be addressed uh, uh, at the same platform uh, or uh, better to say the same mindset maybe uh, uh, yana uh, if uh, uh, can you comment about let's say some uh, climate uh, climate changes uh, uh, tracer or or how I, I don't know how 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 it will be it will be addressed. called pod, podnebnik podnebnik yes like <laughs> podnebnik uh, yeah. yeah I think that's that there's a really noble idea behind it um, but it does show a bit of um, mo disciplinarity if, if I may and Zaria please correct me if, if I'm wrong kind of um, coming from from social sustainability point of view I see sustainability as three pillars social economic environmental and obviously in terms of environmental sustainability uh, because the groups have been so active we've come really far uh, not in terms of fighting the climate crisis but in terms of developing and theorizing um, uh, environmental sustainability uh, social sustainability has been lacking behind. So that's something that in with, with Podnebni, the climate change, climate crisis tracker, um, we are planning to bring all those three pillars together um, uh, under one umbrella. Uh, and I think we are still working progress, uh, kind of um, trying to find our own identity in, in what, what is that we are going to do. Um, so Zara, if you want to add anything to that, please do. Um, but we have some, it's really, you know, it's something that we haven't discussed today is I think the pandemic has raised um, the, the importance and relevance of multidisciplinarity, not just interdisciplinarity and not transdisciplinarity, but really all those different disciplines coming together, um, meeting our minds and, and, and fighting for, for a better good from all those disciplines. We fight a lot because obviously we have entirely different understandings of, of what each discipline can do. Uh, but I think that's that's what's pushing progress forward, and that's what's making the future of science. Yeah, maybe I would just add on this what what Diana mentioned. The, the important thing that I that I uh, missed when I was talking about Slidilnik is that we are a group that everyone is equal. So we are not in this. I don't know. Maybe I, as a as an early career researcher, maybe I sit in a bit of a different way. As a, I think that 
in academia hierarchies are quite strong. And when it comes to Snedilnik, there are people from academia, but also people from just general public, from, from computer scientists, data scientists. And we are all equal in a way. Like we, we don't feel these, these strong hierarchies and you are not afraid to say whatever you think or like to criticize one another. We learn, we are actually glad that we criticize one another because we learn with it and that we, we ask, it's not so much criticism, it's more like just asking questions and, and, and making sure that we understand one another. And, and I think this is really refreshing. Um, uh, Leah, uh, yes, I yeah. have a question from, from the chat from, about the Sladilnik. Uh, the question is, uh, do you have any information on uh, who uses this or how many people use it? And if I may, uh, if I may add a question, how do you promote it? Okay, Anna, can you, I don't know how is your memory, but, but as far as I know, like we did have uh, around a million of unique views so far, but like the regular users, I think it's around 200,000 or maybe a bit more. I'm not sure, which is a lot for Slovenia. It means that 10% of people in Slovenia basically comes on our page almost on on, on weekly basis, if not even more often uh, in, in, a, in a month than even, even more people. So we are quite high, even on the public opinion polls. I think we are like 15% of people trust Ledilnik. So this is this is like, I think it's quite a big thing for Slovenia. Um, the, the numbers might sound low, but when it, you put it in percentage by a 2 million population size, it's, it's, it's quite high. Um, what was the second question? I'm sorry, Leah. How do we promote it? Uh, how do we promote it? Uh, we don't, I mean, we, we have don't. social media accounts. Uh, so Twitter, um, Facebook, we tried with Instagram, but didn't follow through. Um, and uh, yeah, that's mostly it. I don't think we do any other promotion and we just, we just learn while doing it. Um, we don't have like a specific strategy uh, when we have time because it's all volunteer based, uh, based as Miro mentioned, we write content because I mean, I think I think that is one thing that we don't really value writing a proper science communication content and interpreting the data in a way that that's accessible to everyone takes time and uh, takes a lot of time also to, to, to read the papers, to combine them, to explain to people what's happening. And then it, it really, sometimes there is more content, sometimes there is less because we just rely on, 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 on our free time. Yeah, maybe if I add that also uh, public organizations uh, use the DILNIC as a, as a source of information. For example, um, our uh, Institute for Public Health, uh, everyday press conferences, uh, uh, information are based on the DILNIC data. I mean, the DILNIC, um, actually needn't uh, a special promotion right now because it is a kind of brand uh, which is uh, absolutely uh, using for uh, yeah, uh, uh, this information. Uh, Jana uh, uh, Kolar, uh, uh, please. Um, I'll uh, give uh, first the opportunity to Vedran who was there before. Ah, okay, I'm sorry, yeah, I, 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 I didn't see again. I raised the physical hand, so oh, yeah. <laughs> I put in more effort. Okay. <laughs> so thank you. Um, I applaud th this, uh, this way of uh, showing data, but I will play devil's advocate here. In an effort to do outreach, you have chosen to disregard that there are plenty of people who do not use the internet, and there are plenty of people who are mistrustful of technology, uh, and you will never reach them by these means. Uh, while I really love seeing uh, these numbers and how they uh, influence uh, my possible creating uh, fact-based decisions on where I travel and when, um, only 10% of the population of Slovenia has accessed it. And those are the ones most likely already on board with the idea that this is, this is nice. So 90% is still out there and haven't been influenced. I know that you can't do everything, uh, but this is, this is an important um, aspect to recognize that there are boundaries to what you can do using technology that has created the problem. Um, and I made a comment earlier that new problems require new ways of thinking and not giving more of the same. So if Yana J says, 
The internet is the problem. It's the root of all evil. Then the cure cannot be more internet. Well, since my hand was up first. Um, okay, yeah. Please. I'm not ja uh, Jana J, but K, but I will say that uh, I don't think that uh, Jana J said that uh, internet is the root of all evil. Um, and I, <laughs> I also, um, I, I agree, I, I see your point, uh, but let me say that, uh, of course, uh, the people, uh, people that do not, uh, that are not active on internet, and I'll correct you, it's 10% uh, of, reg of Slovenians that are regular users, not just that came across the sl uh, Slidilniks, uh, which is a big difference. And 10% of regular users is a very high number, but the rest will uh, mainly rely their opinion on the news that they receive from traditional media. In this case, more television and uh, newspapers, which we are not discussing today. And it's a pity we do not have time for that because they are all also relevant and there are some good practices across the world how, the, uh, how they tackle the issue of pandemic or for example, climate change. But I would like to mention, uh, uh, to add to what uh, Jana was stressing earlier, I think that one of the very good things of uh, Sledilnik is also that it does bring scientists across disciplines together. And this is the only way to address these issues, but also other challenges, for example, as climate change. Now, for example, um, uh, COVID pandemic had shown very clearly that just the development of vaccine is not enough if society does not want to use the vaccine. And if you neglect the importance of social sciences in this respect, you're not going to achieve your goals. So it's, a, it's a basically a good showroom of um, uh, a lot of uh, changes in our society. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I just want to remind that we have three minutes uh, to, to, to close this session. So th this will be the last comments. Please, Jana, uh, Zaria, uh, Gregor, uh, last comments, and yeah, then we have to close. Thank you. I, I hear Webran, uh, and I disagree entirely, because uh, Sledinik, not only it is, it is brand new uh, in a country such as Slovenia, which is really traditional in, in all its many sense and conservative, um, but Sledinik people actually are everywhere. Like, every, everywhere you go, there will be someone from Sledinik. So it's what we can show you here today, because we are online, but we actually are are very active citizens in flesh and blood. Not me, because I've, I've, I've had long COVID for, for the entire year, so I haven't been going around, but my colleagues have. They have been on te television. They have been actually at the vaccination centers talking to people. And I think why Sledilnik is so successful um, in, in not, I wouldn't say outreach, I would say knowledge exchange um, and knowledge transfer is uh, because we came about when the state failed. There was no statistics, there was no data, and there was no evidence-based information provided. There was only politics. And this is where human brain came together, used artificial intelligence, and, and combined the two to communicate better science. Thank you. Zaria? Yeah, I would just try to be really, really short. Um, first of all, as a science communicator, I don't pretend that I impact everyone. I, I never get to everyone. I hope that I give tools to people who can talk in their communities about it and to translate the science to them so then they can uh, provide it to their communities. I hope I do this reach. I'm not sure I do it, but but I hope I do. And it is true what Diana said. Yeah, we are we are everywhere. We do go to communities. We do speak with them. I gave also lectures about about coming from Slovenia about vaccination to, for example, people employed in nursing homes in Slovenia because they asked us to do that, so we prepared that. And then the second thing is I'm gonna step into my active issues. Each campaign, when it comes to political campaign, has a digital campaign going on as well as in the field with. with within communities, canvassing around. And I think Sledilnik can do the, the, the letter, the, the canvassing around and going around the houses. Even so, we try as much as we can, but we do the digital part of it. So I think these both need to go together. And I do agree, yeah, we don't reach everyone, but we, we do what we can do uh, at the moment. And maybe in the future, I, I completely agree with some of the points today that, that we need to invent a new ways of, of doing uh, what we do uh, when it comes to education. Thank you. Maybe Gregor, just last sentence. 
Okay, just very quickly. Uh, I think we are faced with very big challenges as a society. In the future years, we'll have to return the trust into the science and into the knowledge to the society. Uh, I do not think that internet is all evil per se, but it's a problem that it's misused and abused for many things. Uh, so uh, sometimes we hear in Slovenia that oh, being on a uh, social network is not, it's not academic. I think that's a very wrong approach. We have to be on social media. Also, we have to express our opinions. Others will just leave this social media, which are important their communication to the people who disagree with science, and et cetera. Uh, and I think as a society, we'll have to think about, I think Jana already mentioned that, uh, Jana Jay, that we'll have to start to educate people from very early on. We'll have to start, in my opinion, in primary schools to teach kids how to critically assess information. What is the what is science, how science works, things like that. We cannot start that at university. We will have to start that much earlier, I think, in the beginning of the primary school. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Pity, we need to conclude this interesting conversation. We could uh, speak uh, hours and hours, but yeah, I hope audience, uh, the audience enjoyed and got some interesting information. Uh, thanks to uh, speakers, uh, thanks to organizers, and I greet you warmly and wish you successful work today. Lea, it's your work. Thank you very much, Mira, and thank uh, to all uh, our panelists today. Uh, we will have a short break now, and then uh, we continue with session six called Inequalities in Scholarly Communication. And also, I invite you to stay tuned for our last session this afternoon on scholarly communication in times of, of COVID. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thanks, everyone.